So good afternoon everyone. I'm gonna for me this is yelling, so I'll apologize if it comes across as rude, but I don't have a super strong voice. So I'm Gus Pena, I serve as director of the Office of Intercultural Engagement here at UNC Greensboro. I'd like to thank Janae, Gerald, I don't know all the library staff, so if you're here, thank you for hosting this event. Uh, my role from now until five o'clock is to serve as the moderator for this panel, which focuses on intercultural competency in the context of the workplace. And so I've got some questions that I've shared with our panelists. Um, the idea is for us to have a conversation that you all are participating actively in. So while well, we've got some questions that I'll ask that we'll all discuss, at any point we invite you to let us know that you have something to add or you want us to go further and you'd like to guide the conversation in a different way. Please feel free to do that. <laughs> but at this time, I'll invite our panelists to introduce themselves, share a little bit about themselves, and then I'll kick us off with our first question. So my name is Rishon McManus. Uh, this is my last semester at UNCG. Um, I serve as president of the NAACP on campus. I'm also a resident at Oscar Kind of Residence Hall. I'm also a civic engagement fellow uh, in the Office of Leadership and Service Learning. Um, and I've been told to raise my mentoring. So I go to school such as Harrison Middle School um, and mentor kids um, from a historically disadvantaged background. <coughs> Hello, my name is Patrick Wilton. I'm the assistant director of the Global Engagement Office for a subset of the International Program Center over in Paris. I've been at UNCG for about two and a half years now. Um, I have a varied background. About 15 years I was in the field of teaching English as a second language, so I had the opportunity to live overseas in Japan for about four years. Despite my, my undergraduate degree is actually in biology. When I was in the research laboratories, I was so much more interested to talk to my um, graduate assistants from different countries and learn about their countries than I was to do the actual science experiment, so that kind of took me to that path of ESL as a way to kind of explore the world. Happy to be here. I'm Keisha Valette, um, and I have been, I just got back to UNC, um, I started working here again as an instructor in January. But prior to that, I was I did my undergraduate at UNC I got my master's in North Carolina Central. Then I worked uh, here at UNC Greensboro at Jackson Library. I was the university resident librarian, the second one. Um, then I left to go and get my PhD, um, and now I'm back um, teaching at. UNCG and LIS. Um, I am a military child, so I have lived all over. I started college in Germany, UNCG Temple, finished high school in England, so I've been around a lot of different kinds of people. Um, and my, my history, my background is in critical theories. Um, particularly critical race theory um, and black theory. What was last Black. It's like Latino. Latinx. So that's the panel, uh, and I'll offer just a quick bit so you know kind of who's moderating this thing. So again, Gus Penny, I'm originally from Nicaragua. Um, I came to this country in the mid 80s as Central America was destabilized, lots of U.S. interventionist policy going on during that time. And so I landed in South Florida, made, made my way to Charlotte, North Carolina, um, and I've been in the States for a while. Uh, my work has taken me throughout Latin America, Indian, South America, uh, and I've also spent some time in South Africa and in the UK as well. And now I'm here at UNC. So, um, first question, and we can just sort of take it as we want to, and again, we invite your thoughts as well. If you can talk about intercultural competence, what that means to you in a globalized workplace. So, in our world is constantly changing and constantly evolving, um, and we begin to emphasize the idea of like, inclusivity. It's important that we understand um, each other's culture. I studied abroad in Germany um, in the spring of I mean, 2016, and one thing I noticed was just the difference in communication. 
So when I would talk to someone who was German, it was more so like the normal conversation. You know, it wasn't like this American home, just hey, how are you doing? Because it's it's polite to say. You know, when I would stop someone and talk to them like, hey, how are you doing? They would genuinely expect for me to um, ask like, how are you going? You know, uh, find out more about themselves. Um, rather here in the States, it's more so, um, hey, how are you doing? Yeah, I gotta go. <laughs> um, so, yeah, cultural competence is just understanding, you know, uh, communication differences, uh, cultural differences, uh, and just respect. I, um, I think that these questions for the talk today, and I think they are intensely difficult questions. Um, probably partially because some of the stuff that you were talking about, um, you don't know how someone else is going to take if you say something as simple as, um, and you can only come from your own particular context. Um, so you're going to have your own preconceived notions about how someone should respond, or react, or actually react more to. Um, so I think when I really have to stop and think about what this intercultural competence mean in the globalized workplace, I think it means uh, taking a pause and realizing that just because you interpret something some way doesn't mean that's how the other person needs it. Um, I'm teaching reference right now, uh, and so I talk a lot about the reference But in a way, having those skills to be able to speak with someone uh, openly, like have an open conversation that doesn't just cut off, um, is really, really important in the workplace in general. Being able to just communicate openly and honestly and not judgmentally because you really don't know where that other person is. You have no idea. Even if I came up and was blocking someone else and I was like, hey, you're also the diversity resident librarian, so you must feel exactly the way I do. Obviously, no, that's ridiculous. So, um, I think take a pause and take everything kind of, um, in stride until you understand where that other person is coming from and how you will be able to get that other person home. And I think adding to the two other panelists, um, commonly when people look at intercultural competence, they look at three main areas. They look at knowledge, they look at skills, and they look at attitudes. And both of you have, have touched on those. The, the knowledge, I think you said it really well, that so often we don't think about our, our own identity and who we are and we're, where we're coming from. Like That's a really important place to start, is you need to know yourself and your own culture and what you believe. And I think a lot of people, especially going through high school, undergraduate, they're still trying to find themselves out a little bit, for sure. Um, but kind of starting there, and, but not only knowing yourself, but knowing the greater world as well too. Taking the time to learn about world issues, and not only from an American perspective, but getting those ideas from other news sources, looking at Al Jazeera, looking at BBC, how are other cultures looking at the same issue from a different perspective? So there's that knowledge area. Um, there's Maybe going over to the attitude, where it's actually have my notes. I'm not a good off the top of my head speaker. I have to kind of look at my notes. Um, but with the attitudes, um, respecting, valuing the culture is an important thing. Some people, there is no culture. You know, we're all just people. We all just get along. But understanding that no, there are different cultures, and those people have different frames of reference, and that's perfectly fine. That you need to be able to respect that um, and tolerating as well to tolerating ambiguity and tolerating you may not always sometimes we feel we know what it is and this is how it is but with a different culture from a different reference point that same topic could be a much grayer area and being able to kind of be okay with that and the other area was the skills as well skills being able to said listen openly that's a really really important thing the skill just to kind of step back and observe and not feel that you need to press your point, you need to press your point. Those are all things I think that go into intercultural competence. And like you said, as the world is becoming more global and more diverse, both in the United States and around the world, these are things that we need. I, I saw one statistic that they, the Economist interviewed CEOs from like 68 different countries. And like 
like the number one cause of problems for the CEOs was the cultural problems within their, that's not just here in North Carolina, but it's around the world, like 90% of people. So that was their number one problem. It's cultural. <laughs> I just want to add one other thing that is always kind of a pet thing, but that there aren't just differences um, between cultures, across cultures, but there are differences within cultures. I'm, I'm half Puerto Rican, I don't speak any Spanish. If someone comes up to me and talks to me, I'm not going to know what they're saying. That doesn't mean I'm not proud of the fact that I'm half Puerto Rican. But, um, but I am very much, because of that, I am very much aware of differences within a culture, and those also need to be kind of understood and respected, um, and not So I want to push and poke a little bit. You talked about, um, how I saw it is when we make assumptions that someone else sees a situation from our lens, from our value system, that's not always the case. And you also talked about, Patrick, um, communication styles being uh, more tolerant with ambiguity. As I was listening to you, one of the things that I'm thinking is that depending on what cultural context we're in, communication is very direct, or it's, it's more ambiguous, or uh, there's a space in the workplace for talking about things that are personal. In other cases, it's not appropriate to talk about personal things in the workplace. So what I realized I knew this, is that conflict is going to be inevitable when you have different cultural identities, different value systems operating in the same workplace with some common goal. And so understanding that conflict is going to be inevitable, um, how do we get over that? How, how do we go through situations when conflict is going to be inevitable and still get the goal accomplished still coexist. Do you have examples or things that haven't worked? You'll never leave this at my place. That's just when you're wondering if this is the task force. Because you remember how three times you shove everything in the drive? One of the notes, kind of my other point that I wanted to mention is just that kind of step back and just chill out. I think that's like a, one of the ways that I try to live my life just based on, I, I lived in Japan for four years, I also lived in New Zealand, Australia, I've been to a number of other countries too, and it's so easy just to jump to a conclusion about something, and I think it is really important. <laughs> Like Gus says, conflict is going to be inevitable, but since you know that that's going to happen, when it does happen, just step back for a moment, take a breather, try to think of it from another perspective, from another point, rather than just jumping to a conclusion. I can't tell you this conflict I have a question, kind of, uh, on the topic of what you guys are talking about. So you're talking about just kind of like taking a step back and things like that. Uh, from my perspective, what I've noticed is like, well, I'm a first generation American, so I fall under a lot of different sort of minority categories for many different reasons. Um, and as I'm going into the workplace, I've realized that it not necessarily is a culture thing, the thing that a young, young professionals are having an easier time, um, you know, understanding other cultures and being open minded. But then when the young professionals are working with, uh, the older generation, the older generation are having a harder time kind of adapting to the mindset that many of the professionals have. How do you kind of talk to those of the older generation that are having a hard time adapting versus and then having them work well with young professionals that are more open minded to new ideas, new cultures, and their goals to adapt? I would say part of that is the educational part that he's talking about. Um, so, um, <clears throat> we keep saying culture, and I think that everyone is probably assuming mostly ethnic and racial culture, but there are generational cultural differences. Um, and you can, and it's up to you guys if you want to do that, but you can study those generational cultural differences. There are places to go. There are workplace, there are workshops here that I went to that talked about um, those cultural differences between generations and the different ways that generations communicate. So it might be uh, beneficial to actually just take some time and look into it and say, okay, I have a lot of people that are this age in my, this age group and kind of figure out um, 
how that generation views communication. Do they think that if you are communicating with them over the email instead of walking to their office, that's rude? Um, do they want you to take time to come to their office and actually sit down and speak with them? Is that something that they are used to or would prefer? Figure it out. Uh, there are a lot of studies that you can actually look into um, and kind of and, and see where those where those generational gaps lies, and also um, in the ways that you communicate, especially for people that are younger and have a tendency to um, make words or use um, acronyms or something like that, which people might not like or even understand what you're saying. Um, and then there's the instance of checkout. Even me, I'm the oldest of five kids. So between me and my younger sister, there's a 20-year 20, 20 age difference. Um, so sometimes the things that she says to me, I can't. I would never. She's like, I went to my boss and I was so upset and I started crying and she felt free to do that. I would never in a billion years do that and I don't understand it and I like, no, you must be professional at all times. Um, and uh, but she has to enjoy communication and I know that. Um, so I have had to learn that for her, being emotional and getting really frustrated is what she needs to go through to get to the other side and then understand and learn and be able to communicate with people. Um, but as an older person, myself, I, I, she's my sister, so I'm okay with it, but if I was in work, I would find it. So it's also a little bit on that other person um, to, to try to adapt, but because you can't because you well, want to change your own behavior, not someone else's. <laughs> it's kind of, I, I don't know if I'm unfortunately, I think it's going to be more unless they decide for themselves yeah. that they want to understand or to change their behavior. And then there's also just the fact that someone doing something for a really long time, regardless of their age, get really entrenched in what it is they're doing. They can really see how that can be beneficial, um, and the learning curve can be really, really steep. And so you're trying to convince them eventually this will be better, uh, but at that moment it's not. It's all a mess. Uh, so understanding that as well and being willing to work with them and talk to them and when you get frustrated with them, just take, take, take a step back, go outside, take care of yourself, and then come back to a situation that's really important. Also, I think self care is really important for dealing with conflict. Um, take care of yourself. Yell outside or something, <laughs> and then um, come back. But but I think badly. But mostly, probably, I need to to get an idea of how the different generations communicate. No, uh, one second. Um, Michaela Portugal is here. Thank you for joining us. I think you had an exam or class, something like that. Um, SGA Vice President, we all introduced ourselves, so in just a minute I'll invite you to do the same. Before, I want to see if I can put you over there so the folks behind you can see. So y'all bear with us. Two seconds. Let's do this. Let's make it happen. And everybody can see everybody. Okay. Right, sorry, go ahead. No, no problem. So well, actually, I'm sorry. I just said we're going to have Michaela introduce herself and then we'll continue. Okay. I'm Michaela Portugal. I'm currently a junior and I'm the current student government vice president. All right. So, to touch upon your question about uh, like generational gaps in the workplace, uh, one thing I noticed is that like, we become a product of our environment. So, you know, being that we're college students, we're constantly immersed in uh, like a diverse environment. So there's, you know, most opportunities to go to an event of like a multicultural uh, organization or an African American um, organization, so like the NWCP, which is dominated by African Americans. Um, so there's like constantly opportunities to like be immersed in like different cultures, perspectives, and opinions on like various topics. Now with the workplace, it's, ten, it's usually like one like dominant culture or um, usually one perspective, regardless of like where you may work, whether that's Wall Street or uh, with the civil rights organization or um, with like the EPA, it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's not as like um, culture diverse as a campus would be, that makes any sense. And Gus, I also wanted to touch upon your question about um, like overcoming problems in the workplace due to like cultural differences. Um, one, one skill that you know, I would find to be important is listening skills. You know, when I come into a job or when I come into um, a new environment, 
obviously I'm going to be in the perspective of an African American male. You know, that's not something that just drops away um, when I enter a new workplace or um, a place I'm not familiar with. So what's important for me is to take the time to step back and understand that the way that I may do things or the way that I may have a certain outlook on life is not going to be exactly the same as someone else, you know, their outlook or their position, which is fine because um, I believe that understanding different perspectives can also enhance my perspective. Um, and it can also like point out the flaws in how I may do things. So one key to overcoming like cultural differences is just to listen and listen to like understand and not to um, like respond. So along that vein, um, for a college student, what would be some skills that you would highlight as before you graduate, these are some things that you should work on if you're interested in working in a global workplace, which I think would be most workspaces, whether you're going into education or you're going into entrepreneurship or in the health sciences. You've got different cultures, both visible and invisible, everywhere. So what would be some key skills? You started with the first one being a strong ability to listen. Are there others? I think one that I've seen emerge more and more over the past few years compared to when I was in university is the idea of critical reflection. I think a lot of time, young people, they just act or just do it. but kind of taking that moment of, okay, you've done something, there was a result, could be a good result, could be a bad result, now taking that step back and examining why that result occurred, reflecting back, kind of thinking about, you know, a lot of people think, oh, to build intercultural competence, let me just go abroad, and studying abroad could be a really good experience, or it could have no impact on you whatsoever, it depends how much you decide to engage with the host culture, it depends how much you decide to look at the different opportunities and experiences you have and then at the end of the day kind of think about those and learn from those and share those experiences with others and kind of compare and contrast. So I think um, in addition to listening and being open, um, critical reflection is one other skill that's a really important one to develop. And I think a lot of your classes are asking you to do that with reflection papers and you know you may have the theory. I think maybe that's the problem too that sometimes you read all these like theoretical journals and you have to reflect on those, but maybe you don't do that as much in your daily life with intercultural um, interactions that can happen. You're just kind of taking it to that level. Yeah. You also need to be curious about your life. Um, I, I, I'm a critical theorist, so you said critical, and I'm like, yes, absolutely. Um, um, and you, but you need to take those, um, those critical thinking skills with you uh, everywhere. It's important to develop them in school, yes, but um, if you're not curious about the world around you, then you're only thinking critically about your little small slice that you see. You have to be curious enough to go out and seek and search and get different perspectives when you're talking about the different... Um, I like to read. I prefer to read uh, newspapers or news articles from outside of the country talking about the United States. Um, because you're going to get a different perspective. And I'm sure, and the people in my class have already probably heard me talk about confirmation bias, um, but there is such a thing as confirmation bias where you have a tendency to see um, and know and continue to look for and be confirmed and find the same information over and over again. And that is the way the world is geared nowadays. We are geared, Netflix tells us these are the movies you're going to like, you should watch these. Um, unless you're curious and you look for something completely different, when you go on Google and you start, you're going to get sponsored ads first. You're not going to get the information that you think is that's actually most relevant. So, and when you're, when you're thinking about the workplace and uh, intercultural competency and dealing with conflicts and everything else, if you are not curious enough about the people that work around you um, to get to know them better and then to think critically about what you're doing, works but doesn't work then you're you're going to end up being that person that is there and does it the same way over again because this is how we do it and this is how I was told so um, yeah you have to be willing to learn lifelong learning you have to be a lifelong learner I just said that one little point that's a really good point that intercultural competence is not a workshop you can take in an hour and okay 
and which are culturally competent now. It's, it's, the studies have shown that it's a lifelong endeavor. It takes a lifetime of constantly working on it and refining to get more. And I think that curiosity, you need to be ready to be uncomfortable. You need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable and really put yourself out there. Because, I mean, I see it even here in the student organizations. You won't find something unless you're actually looking. So just get ready to, like, honestly put yourself in those different cultures and understand and listen to those. Uh, yes. Um, my name is Shalik Broussard. I'm a 2001 graduate of UNCG. Um, I, I now work at Winston-Salem State University, and I'm the uh, event coordinator and all that good stuff over there. Um, and uh, my main reason for coming here, I'm also part of the uh, Diversity and Inclusion Council. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to learn more about how it is to now graduate from a PWI and work at an HBCU. Does and everyone say, know what PWI oh, is? Oh, and I, that was my problem, too. When I graduated from here, I had no clue what a PWI or HBCU was. So like, that's what HBCU is. Some people are PWI not PWI is predominantly white institution, and HBCU is historically black college or university. Um, did not know that until I, until I left here. No one talked about that. But um, one thing that I learned um, being here at UNCG was I was able to be around more than just my regular community. Um, and then I'm from Seattle, Washington, so I've been around a lot of different cultures. But um, coming to a university where every day you have no choice but to be around different cultures, leaving here, going to Winston-Salem State, where I'm now around students who are always around a comfortable space. Um, that's one thing I talk about. I know you had mentioned um, um, you know, traveling globally and uh, uh, what is it, studying abroad. I push students to all the time because I didn't do that while I was here. I, didn't, I, don't, I don't know why I didn't. I, I think I was just enjoying myself a little too much. But, um, <laughs> but I push students to do that because a lot of them come from, uh, let's say, Greensboro or Winston and they grew up in this city and that was it. I have a student that um, graduated, is from Durham. Her mother did not drive around, so she never left outside of Durham until she graduated. She was graduating from her high school there, and they drove up to D.C. It was the first time stepping out of Durham. So, and you had mentioned, you know, it's not just globally, it's, it's, it can be within our communities. So I press my students at Winston State to realize that you can't just get comfortable with where you're at at Winston State and then that your student population here was some state. Sometimes go visit Wake Forest University. Uh, you know, definitely come to UNCG. Um, and I've talked to a couple of the students and told them, I need you guys to come and bring some of what you do here at UNCG over to Winston State. Because a lot of these students, they're still coming from their community into another community that's just like their community. And then they, they leave that um, university and go into a job that has the same thing. Or they step into a job that's totally different and never really immerse themselves into different cultures and then they're scared and they're, well, I don't want to work in because I'm not comfortable because when I talk they can't understand me or I don't understand what they're saying. And that this should have been the, the space in which they were able to experience that at their university. So I don't know, I was more of a comment in what was going through my, uh, my mind when you guys were talking. So not sure how much you guys can take from what I was saying. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think, um, I'm sorry, I, I see. I think it's a really good point because we did mention here that a lot of times people, once they're in school, that's where they get an experience of other cultures. But actually, frequently, it's the opposite. Um, they don't get experience of other cultures. Um, and 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 we're, we're assuming workplaces where the people have gone to college, and we shouldn't be. <laughs> um, so if you're in a workplace where there are several people there that have never left their community, um, then, then yeah, there's not going to be that experience just to be able to have My question was going to be, um, I was hoping someone could just quickly define or comment on what is meant by a global workplace. I've heard that term used multiple times in the conversation. Sure. I, I, I was thinking about, so how do I describe a workplace where you've got generational, racial, ethnic, crosses international national boundaries so that it could mean any kind of workspace where you're interacting with information, currency, whatever kind of environment. So it's, it's I, I don't have a specific way that I'm defining it. As, and as you can see, I think most folks have taken it 
to, and spoken about it from their context. You're talking about it from Winston Salem State's context and the people there. So really broadly, yeah. Right. I think um, thinking about what a globalized workplace is, all you need to do is look at your family. Um, we are, none of us are the same. None of us are the the same racially, gender, um, and we could be talking about sexual orientation, anything of those things. So in, in my mind, a globalized workplace is basically one that isn't just me. If there's another person, then it's globalized. And I think the, the skills of intercultural competence translate, regardless of if it's between culture or just between two different, between the generations, that you need to use the same skills that you do with different cultures. I have another question, but I just kind of piggyback off of that. We're talking a lot about, you know, expanding yourself you know, beyond your community. But one thing that I've noticed talking to not just college students, but high school students and middle school students is they're unable to expand their beyond their community because, for example, they don't have the financial needs to expand beyond their community. So how do you address a situation like that where you have students that they'd love to expand themselves, but they can't go beyond the TV set in their living room because their family financially can't oh, really, they can't go, you know, outside of their town. They can't afford to go somewhere else. So how do you address an issue like that? One thing, if they're from Greensboro, yeah. I think people sometimes don't realize, I, I'm new to Greensboro, I'm from Boston originally, but how culturally diverse Greensboro is, and my kids are in the Guilford County school system. Do you have any idea how many countries are represented just in Guilford County? 140. Over 100, yeah, and over 120 languages within the Guilford County school system. So granted, it's not everyone walking down the street, but I think there are lots of opportunities. Greensboro is a huge rebel, uh, refugee resettlement center, the Center for New North Carolinians. There are so many organizations that they could volunteer with you. Usually you have to be volunteer work for high school. So even if you're not leaving the country, if you're in an area as diverse as Greece, where there's a lot of local resources to tap in. Also, I feel we have to say um, the library. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if they can get to the library, and if there is a library in their community, because I know that a lot of communities, if the yes, are your communities, they don't have the libraries. Um, but hopefully, if they can get to it, that's another place to learn and grow and do so. Basically, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, but are you referring to field trips or like opportunities outside of like middle schools and high schools where students can be? Um, that can that can tie in, that can tie into it as well. Um, I just wanted to talk. I mean, yeah, field trips could play a part in it, but you know, just you know, having that curiosity factor of you know, well, what's beyond my town, what, what else is there to see, what else of the world is there to see, um, however, you know, maybe their family financially can't support them going somewhere else to, you know, explore that realm of curiosity that they want to. Field trips can factor into that because I've been in situations, well, not personally, but I've seen students in situations where they know their family necessarily can't support them to go on a field trip and, you know, teachers or something else pay for them to go, or they just don't go at all, so then they're kind of stuck in this rut where they can't kind of, you know, explore those fields that they were looking at in school. That's, I was going to say that's a really good point because um, usually if there are like schools or students who attend schools um, and the students like, you know, not able to like finance a field trip or um, even go somewhere out of Greensboro because there are a lot of students who haven't even left the city of Greensboro, uh, then a lot of schools should take the initiative to provide resources uh, for the students so that they could you know, immerse themselves in different cultures and different environments. Right. I have a, kind of a question for you that's um, along the lines of the question. Because um, uh, when you're talking about, they, you don't always have to, they don't always have to leave to get other, you can bring people in. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and you know, if the schools want to bring in speakers and that kind of thing, I'm sure with the university here, I'm sure people would be willing to do that. Um, so I'm curious to know, you, you kind of touched on it in your opening, but some of the things that you were doing, it sounds like you already do those kind of things in the community. As far as like mentoring goes, mm -hmm. yes, I mentor at Harrison Middle School. Um, and many of the students come from um, not their, they're not privileged, not privileged backgrounds, so it's come from like broken homes or uh, low socioeconomic statuses. 
Um, this school, Harrison Middle School, is predominantly African American, um, as well as like people of color and Hispanic students. Um, so I go there. I would have been there today, but I want to make sure that I was at the RCA Expo. Uh, but I'll be back uh, Friday uh, afternoon. So what do you do there? So what do you do to help get them more exposed? Okay. So as far as like providing resources, I myself cannot do that because um, I don't have like. I'm a college student, I don't have the financial means to uh, make sure that they're uh, going on field trips or, um, you know, visiting. I have to say one thing, okay, I have to. Information is a resource. Okay, well then I provide a lot that. of that. Yes, you can. I provide a lot of that. Um, so when I go, um, usually I follow the guidelines of what the teacher would prefer me to do, uh, whether that's working with groups or working with the individual student. But I do inform them on college and the opportunity to study abroad. Um, and you mentioned that even when you study abroad, that doesn't necessarily mean you get something out of it. But just letting them know that there's an opportunity um, to go to college. Or I do something as simple as wear maybe like a UNCG sweater. And they would ask me questions like, you know, so what school do you go to? Um, most of them say it's A&T, but not going to even say So, um, yeah, providing information, just getting them, like getting their mind thinking about college, um, you know, different cultures, fraternities, sororities, whatever it is may be. If that's okay, I would like to comment on this point too. Um, I taught middle school after leaving undergraduate, um, and I kind of immediately, I think, realized after leaving college that, like, getting a syllabus from an instructor was such a privilege because somebody else is telling you what information you need to know. Because, I mean, there's so much information out there and it's easily accessible. And I think all students, you know, especially middle school students, um, which is where my background was too, they're so curious about the world. And so it's sometimes like it, at that age also, you don't know what you don't know because nobody has told you. And, and so I think in that way, like even just introducing students to like new books or music or films or um, anything, I think, could help give them a passion, um, something that they could feel like could be maybe uniquely theirs, that they could uh, learn more about. Um, and so I think just like getting that information, especially in, you know, in a library even, and saying like, hey, this, this is, I think this is really cool, like, check this out. Um, and it doesn't even have to be in a professional capacity, I don't think, even though that's great. I think that that's um, helping a student grow um, and become like more, giving them a jumping, jumping off point, I guess. So that's, it sounds like you're doing awesome work, though. Thank you. So, um, for we've talked about listening, we've talked about critical reflection, and we've talked about curiosity as being three key assets that that are essential for someone who can be successful working in a global environment, in a workspace where there's different cultures, both the visible and the invisible. Uh, and we've got folks here who represent backgrounds and experiences that possessed one, if not all three of those. And we've got uh, students at the elementary, middle school, high school, community college, four-year college level, folks who didn't have access to higher education, who may not have any of those three, they still coexist with us in these spaces. Uh, so these are folks who get it, who live it, who will continue to live it, and the question I'd like to pose for the panelists, but also anyone here to respond to, is folks who don't see the value or don't have to be jarred from their comfort zone, how, how do you do that? How, how have you been successful at getting someone to get out of their comfort zone and find value in their own way in something that you have a passion for or get already? These, these people exist in our families, they, ex they exist in our workspaces, open to anyone. I'm kind of have commentary on that, um, but I think it really well. So I joined a sorority here on campus, however the sorority, the sorority was a panelic sorority, it wasn't part of the Divine Eye. 
So majority of the women that I were that I joined the sorority with happened to be white. Um, so when I was interacting with not just sorority women, but I was interacting with fraternity men, uh, white fraternity men, they were very much used to their bubble that they were used to. They were comfortable. They were from upper middle class white families. Uh, you know, they didn't have it. So seeing a black girl in panelytic sorority kind of confused them, and they were had questions, and they were confused, and they were like. Well, why didn't you join the Divine Nine? Why are you? Why are you the you Divine know? Nine? Can you? The Divine Nine are uh, basically like nine, um, excuse me, historically bat, uh, black Greek organizations. Um, Greek organizations, excuse me. So, you know, you get a lot of questions, you get a lot of side looks, you get a lot of, okay, this is different. Um, and then it's just kind of, um, like you said, um, you know, it's not a making them change, it's kind of, you know, Know, hey, like this is why I've made my choice. This is if you just want to take the time to listen and see, like this is the decision I made. You know, I'm not that much different from you. We just happen to have different pigmentation in our skin. We're pretty much the same type of person. You know, I this organization just happens to be a lot more of this sort of race or this sort of ethnicity, and then this organization has this sort of ethnicity. We still share different. We still have a lot of the same beliefs, a lot of the same values. Uh, you know, and doing that over, I'm a senior now, over the past four years, you know, you see people kind of open up their horizons and they're like, you know, like, hey, like, I go home and I realize that, dang, all of the people that I surround with kind of look the same. I come back to UNCG and I see, you know, Greek life is more than just, you know, the type of people I hang out with. There's these types of people and these types of people. Wow. Sounds like patience is what I was hearing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some, some courage, probably. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would say definitely challenging people, making them uncomfortable. I mean, not meanly or bluntly. It's just putting the facts out there in, in their face. They can't ignore that, really. Um, and those facts could be anything like, um, you know, facts about different cultures, things like that. Um, I think, oh, facts, you know, just putting the facts out there in front of them so they can't ignore differences between people. Um, like my own background, my, my mother is from a very middle-class white family, a lot of brothers and sisters, but, you know, when she brought my father home, who's from a Pacific island, much darker, that made my grandmother very uncomfortable. But, you know, they kind of grew to ask him more questions and to see what, where he's from, and they grew to love him. So I think, you know, introducing those people to different perspectives in a way that, you know, maybe trying to make them uncomfortable, but present it in a way that they can accept it as fact and if that makes any sense <laughs> so a little bit of this is the way it is Take yeah it leave, and but also introducing to different to, things but at some level way be it. sensitive to where they are developmentally yeah. what their experiences have been and hope that they can meet you some of the way yeah yeah exactly um, oh, I, was, I was just gonna comment really quickly um so I guess more or less I've traveled extensively. I've worked with uh, I've worked with kids. Um, middle school is a big thing. I've worked with middle school kids. Um, I think a lot of this whole culture movement, cultural progression, and this sort of global understanding, it comes down to um, it comes down to a lot of, of like knowing your why and like having some having a, a, a purpose for kind of you know your, your life progression without without necessarily. Knowing, I guess, what you specifically want to do and what you know your life will specifically look like in you know, five years to the day, kind of type thing. Um, because with kids, a lot of their confusion is they don't they're trying to figure out their purpose, and, and in college and really adults too are trying to figure out what, what, why they're on this earth. And so if you um, if you kind of um, and there's a, a video Simon Sinek, um, you can look it up. This dude is phenomenal. The golden circle? Yeah, the, the, the concentric circles, man. It, it just it changed golden my life. Golden circle, everyone. Wow, this guy is like <laughs> um, Simon Sinek, um, S-I-N-E-K. Um, he, he has a TED Talk. I think it's the third most TED, third most watched TED Talk. Ever. I'll write it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll try. <laughs> cool, cool. But, um, yeah, but like I was saying, I think you just have to, because the yeah, when, when, when you boil it down, um, more people with great tools can do great things. So it's not it's not it's not kind of where you start or you know what kind of the, the, the opportunities that you have initially. It's where you end up. And the idea is that 
they've got more access to different opportunities, um, to knowledge, um, to seeing things that are outside of the norm, then ideally you'll become you know more refined and, and understand more things. So just just keep you know identify your purpose and just keep wanting to go more. Uh, to be back on that and what you said, um, and what I keep saying this over and over again, kind of in different ways, but um, in order to help uh, talk to other people and convince other people and whatever, you have to be securing yourself first. Um, otherwise, it's, it's not going to go well. It might come from a place of anger, insecurity, mistrust, whatever. When you are talking to other white Greeks, if you're uh, if you were coming from a place of oh my God, why are they saying this about me and whatever, that's going to come out. That's going to you know come off as, as some kind of defensiveness, um, and that's how other people will, will see it. Uh, and and I think probably most importantly, if you are work if you work on yourself first and understand who you are, what you believe, and you have some kind of strength and security when. People still take it badly. You will be okay because people will still take it badly. When we're giving all these suggestions and tips and tools, and that's great, but it's not going to work for some. It's just not going to work for everybody. It isn't. Um, you know. So you still have to feel secure enough in yourself that that's not going to shake. It's not going to shake you. You're going to keep going on if you're missing. You're going to keep going on with whatever it is you need to do. And if I might piggyback on that as well, I think hopefully it wouldn't stop you from interacting with those people again. Um, even if it's someone in your personal life that you're just really not um, agreeing on something or maybe you feel like you have ultimately different ways that you want to, your why is different. Um, I think that if you like if you just stop engaging with that person or stop seeing that person as a person, then it ends up kind of maybe harming your, your why in the long run. Because um, you still have to show those people that you're a person, you know, that you're there, that you're willing, you're engaging, um, that you're interested in that community, whatever it is. Yeah, I so. think um, we need to remember that developing intercultural competency doesn't mean that we are going to convince the entire world to think like us. Not with, that's not what it means. So, yeah. I'll be saving one that point. Um, one thing I was always told was that experience is the best teacher. So a lot of times for someone to see like a different perspective or understand a different way of life is for them to like, you know, meet someone and interact with someone that's different from them. So a lot of times like I or you can like explain um, how we may be different in some way, shape, or form. But until we actually start to interact with each other, and start to listen to each other and start to watch each other's actions. And then we begin to understand that okay, this is you know this is different. You know this is what I expect. This defies my expectations. So it really comes down to um, you know being willing to interact with people that are different from you, and it falls into um, global competence. Um, but I also want to say I thank you all for my time. I have an end of the evening to attend. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure, and I hope you all have a blessed day. Thank you, Deshaun. Thank you. Oh, you're fine. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> I want to say one small comment. Um, when it comes to work, uh, the workplace um, today, leaving my office, just to say, State University, um, with this on, you know, I, I walked through the office and there were people were like, oh, yeah, she goes, she went to UNC. I have on a sweater. I'm going to, to the university to, to learn more about diversity. And right before I'm leaving, I get hit with, all she has on. So I, I deal with that a lot. Like if you're in my office, two things you'll see. UNCG and the Cowboys. Okay. Um, but, you know, I I love my university. I love my experience. And I try to share it with my students. I try to share it with um, the, the individuals I've worked with. But they hear me. But after they hear me, um, it's, okay, so what do you, okay, so that was that was nice. So you're here with the same state. And what are you here to do? And like, I'm here to, you know, do whatever my job is. But, to walk around and wear something just because I'm a black woman and I went to a predominantly white institution doesn't mean that when I got here I forgot who I was. Very confident in who I am. And you know, just to speak on what you were 
just saying, if you're not confident in who you are, you're gonna it's gonna it's not you become small, but they they see that you're becoming small. It's like, oh, okay, we know that you're not really um, you're not really confident in, in what you're doing, becoming a being a part of that sorority or the fact that you went to UNCG. Um, you're here, and now we're going to kid you with it and not and make you feel like what you are part of isn't good enough or you shouldn't be a part of that because it's not going to make you a better person or it, it hasn't made you a better person. So um, from my experience, that as soon as you said that, it just hit me like, oh, yes, that's exactly what I experience almost every day. Like if I say to the students or someone, like, um, if I'm introducing myself and I say, you know, everyone gets to say, I'm a graduate of Winston Salem State University. And if I stand up, I'm a graduate of UNCG. It's like automatic in the room, and I'm just like, it, but I'm so confident in the fact that my experience didn't have anything to do with what they believe, that I don't have to feel that way, but at the same time, it's a constant battle, and it's going to be a constant battle because of the walls that people put up for asking, well, how is it being a, a black woman in a white, a, a predominantly white sorority? Learn about your experience, and then that might make them want to be a part, versus should have been a part of the because I'm a part of Alpha Phi Omega which is predominantly white so I, I get what you're saying but it's sad and it's scary because it's you've got to constantly teach people or constantly affirm yourself every day. Mm -hmm. Piggybacking off of that I really I was never comfortable about like talking about my own experience and I think now I think the lot just the last year would be when I'm now able to talk about like where I'm from and like accepting who I am. So I didn't explain my background when I was introducing myself. So I'm actually from the Philippines and I lived there for 10 years. However, my mom married my stepdad and he's in the Army military. He's in the US Army. So every three years we have to move. And then, so I've lived in South Korea and Germany and I went to like five middle schools and three high schools. So when I moved back from the community, like within the military is different than like the normal U.S. civil war. Right. Yeah. yeah. So um, moving, it's the military students were more accepting of like, oh, okay, so we're getting 10 new students this week. That's fine. Where are you from? Where did you live? Things like that. But then when I moved to Virginia, people did not understand and did not accept who I was. And they're like, oh, why did we get a new student this year, like in the middle of the year? So nobody was actually like, reaching out and anything like that. So. I made a decision to move to another high school, that's where I graduated, and there were more military students, so they were much more like, able to reach out to me. And even when I got to UNCG, I didn't know like it was a very diverse university, things like that. And then this year, especially living with Holly, she's like, yo, Mikhail lived here, 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 here. She saw some listener, like, listen to her experience and things like that. Now I'm much more comfortable telling you and showing you this is how it is in Germany. This is how it is in South Korea. This is what they eat over there. It's the same. It's they speak their own language. We speak our own language, but we're all the same. Yes. So definitely, with like being confident with yourself. I'm watching time, but I wanted to give you uh, a go minute a little to longer. share your comment, and then. I'll ask the panelists if you have any parting thoughts, and we'll close there. Yeah, work? you can go for five or ten more minutes, we can go as long as you want. So did you have something you wanted to share? No, if you guys I, need to I, go, that's fine. I think, I think a, lot of it, a lot of it has been said. I was just going to say that, um, you know, in the polarizing times that we live in, a lot of times when you engage with somebody in conflict, um, they, if, if, you know, they, if you don't agree with them, they shut down, or they walk away, or they say, they diminish your argument, and then, you know, if you don't have a strong sense of self, which is derived from having a purpose and from experiencing things and you know being curious, then you'll just you'll just diminish. And so these these talks um, are really meant more to affirm your individuality and to be accepting of it and to, to own it, to, to be proud of it, you know, whatever that looks like, so that when you meet people that don't see eye to eye on you know, whatever politics or you know the workplace or dress, whatever, whatever it may be, that you can, you can, you know, have be so strong in who you are that it's immaterial. And I think, you know, being in college and being different, and, you know, recognizing those differences definitely helps for the next level. Any, any parting final thoughts? I think I would be remiss in my officially UNCG duties if I didn't mention the Global Engagement Office and where I work. 
So we've been talking a lot about how UNCG has a lot of diversity on campus. At the higher levels, the university is really working hard to leverage that diversity into impactful um, areas. So the, the Global Engagement Initiative is a five-year initiative and we're halfway through it right now. The university has put a lot of resources behind um, our office going out to work with faculty members to incorporate these ideas of intercultural competence into their curriculums throughout whether you're a biology major or a sociology major or anthropology. So that's a really good thing that they're doing. Um, we have a lot of initiatives with the first year students with the Tricker first year come and read. It has to have a global um, component to it. We have, people may have heard of our global leadership program. We work with the Office of Leadership and Service Learning with their bronze, silver, and gold and try to influence those global connections as well too. So if you're interested, just look at global engagement at UNCG for all the, that work. And this is just something that I have up in my office that I try to re remind myself of all the time. And it's just the earth that says, we're all in this together. And I think it is really important to remember that. But we are all in it together. And people's viewpoints can be different. But that can be OK. We have to be OK with that. That's something I'm always trying to remind myself. I just want to real quick thank the libraries for hosting an event like this. And thank everyone that actually came because these can be really uncomfortable conversations. Um, and you came to listen and speak your truth yourself. Um, so I appreciate everybody being here and that this is even 